Please be opening your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. We'll be studying mostly from that chapter, but I want to get the stage set. First of all, you know that today many people believe that there are actually end time signs, such as wars and rumors of wars and such thing as that, that tell us that the second coming of Christ is near. That viewpoint is basically held by those we know as premillennialists. They believe when the Lord came to set up his kingdom because the Jews would not believe on him, he set up the church sort of an afterthought. So they do not think the church is the kingdom and they do not think the kingdom is the church. They therefore think of the kingdom coming yet in our future. They think of it as an earthly kingdom. There are some variations among them as to how they approach that. Jehovah's Witnesses would have Christ with a literal 144,000 in heaven reigning over that kingdom on earth because the earth has been reconstituted like the Garden of Eden. Most of the rest who are premillennialists believe that Christ will rule on earth for a literal thousand years. He'll rule from Jerusalem. A lot more things connected with that. But the thing they all share in common is that they believe there are what they call end time signs. Signs that give us an inclination, an idea that the Lord is coming back very soon. Well, I'm 77 years old, and as long as I've been able to understand such things, which goes back quite a ways, there's been somebody predicting that the Lord was coming back at some given point. And if you look into history, you'll find out that's happened over and over again. Let me say up front, there are no end time signs as they look forward or no signs, period, whether they look for any certain signs or not. There are no signs that precede the coming of our Lord. Now they will go to Matthew 24 and by twisting of the scriptures and a refusal to write and divide the word of truth, mainly because of their other views concerning the kingdom and the church that I mentioned early on, they think they've found certain signs that will herald the second coming of Christ. But let's look at Matthew, inspired of the Holy Spirit. Remember, originally writing for the people of that time. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John fundamentally are designed to prove Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God, that He is the Messiah. And Matthew primarily writes to the Jew. Now, with that in mind, go with me to not just 24, but the last few verses of 23. And before we get to those verses, notice throughout chapter 23, Jesus scathingly upbraids and rebukes the scribes, the Pharisees, he calls hypocrites. He calls a generation of vipers. He even says, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? So that's said to the people of that time regarding their specific sins. The principles, of course, are the same. You don't love God and keep his commandments, you will lose your soul. But he says these particular things to them. Because I don't know of any Pharisees alive today. I think I know of hypocrites, and a whole lot more I don't know that are, but they are. But nevertheless, it's aimed originally, as are all the books of the New Testament, to the people of the first century to whom it was addressed. Now that's how God saw fit to give his truth, the truth of the gospel into the world. He applied it to the people of those times. The truth is the same, but we must realize the times into which it was originally revealed and given. 
So you see in verse 24, you blind guides which strain a gnat and swallow a camel. You come on over to verse 37 where he's lamenting the fact that the people of Jerusalem rejected every prophet sent unto them. He stood ready to forgive them, but they would not. Then notice verse 38. And no, remember, his apostles are listening to all of this. This is being said in the temple. He's there for the last time before his death. And notice verse 38 of chapter 23. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Now, he calls the temple your house. Why does he do that? When he cleansed the temple two times in his earthly ministry, he pointed out, you are taking this place that was meant by God to be used as a place of worship, and you've turned it into a house of merchandise. You've made it, he says, a den of thieves. And he says, my father's house. But now he says, your house. Why does he switch? Because they were not intent upon doing what Moses said regarding that temple. They were determined to do as they pleased. And any time people begin to do that, it's theirs. And in this case, what was originally God and they would have no knowledge at all of the tabernacle and the temple and the priesthood system and all of that without the law of Moses. But they're doing as they please. And you find out what kind of people they are. Look in verse 33. You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Notice verse 31. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. These are exceedingly wicked, rebellious people. So this house that was God's house, intended by the law to be used as God wanted the Jews under the law to use it, is now their house, but now that it's become their house, what's the future of it? Your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, verse 39, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now, don't forget what you've learned about in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord means in the name of Jesus by his authority. On the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, they were told after having brought to, been brought to belief in Christ by the things that had been done and said on that day, men and brethren, what shall we do? They're believers. So he tells them, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So the person that comes to them in the name of the Lord is coming to them by the authority of Christ. Virtually he's predicting the matter of Christians. They're not Christians yet. Church hasn't been established. Christ hasn't died at this time that Matthew's writing about. Now, there were no chapters and verses in the original text, so he moves into what we have as chapter 24. Notice, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple, so we know where he was. You can't depart from that which you weren't in. Now, notice these things are weighing very heavily upon the disciples. They came to him, as they leave the temple, were to show him the buildings of the temple. You had the temple proper, the actual temple, but then you had various buildings and porticos and so forth around the temple, such as Solomon's porch, which is mentioned in the book of Acts and so on. What is over there today and called the Wailing Wall is one of those outer walls. It's not the temple proper. It was totally and completely destroyed by the Romans in AD 70 when they put down the revolt of the Jews and under the legions of Titus, they destroyed Jerusalem with it, the temple. So this is some 30 years before that would take place. Now keep that in mind also. So they show in the temple their Jews steeped in their understanding of things and in their traditions. So they're looking, saying, look at this, look at that. 
Jesus, as he did many times, took those opportunities to teach them a far greater lesson. And Jesus said unto them, you're saying, look at this, all right, see you not all these things? Now here's where he drops a hydrogen bomb on their understanding. Verily, which means truly, it's a fact, so be it. I say unto you, the disciples, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. I want to say again, it's hard. In fact, I think it's completely impossible to realize the jarring fault that was to these men as they were showing him the temple. But then a new paragraph starts in verse 3. They've journeyed out the eastern gate. They've gone across the valley of Kidron, the Sidron as it's called sometimes. Now they're over on the Mount of Olives. And he sat upon the Mount of Olives. It was customarily for the teacher to sit in those days. So it's still on their mind. They walked a good little ways across there. Something's weighing on their mind. And what is it? The disciples came unto him. Notice this word. Privately. They ask him questions. Based upon what he has said in verse 2, tell us, us who, the disciples, tell us when shall these things be? There's the first question. What things, when not one stone shall be left upon another? Concerning what? The temple. Tell us when these things be, shall be. Then he ask, they ask a second question. Because the Jew could not fathom such a thing happening except at the end of the world as we use that terminology. So, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? Now, mark that. Two questions. When shall these things be? What things? When not one stone will be left upon another of the temple. And the next one, what is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So, there's... Actually, three questions. The second one's a compound question. The sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. Now, Jesus answers the questions in the following verses as they were put to him. Notice, and Jesus answered. He said unto them, again, let me ask you, who's the them? Jews living in the first century around A.D. 30. What Jews? The disciples. What disciples? The apostles have come to him privately. Now he warns them of that which they needed to know for their own spiritual good. This is said to them. It is true in the rest of the New Testament. It's enjoined upon all of us if we would be faithful. And what is it? Take heed that no man deceive you. I have that obligation. Regarding the things that Jesus is talking about to them and answering their questions... They specifically concerning themselves have that obligation. What? Don't be deceived, that is. Don't believe a falsehood or a lie. Why is that the case, Lord, we ask in our minds? For many shall come in my name. What? Many are going to claim to be the Messiah, be you? Yeah, many, not a few. Saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. You remember in the epistles, many false prophets shall arise, Peter said. Well, they're going to deceive a lot of people. A lot of folks are going to believe their lives. Remember Paul's writing in 1 Timothy 4. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience here the hot iron. Okay, how you're deceived, you believe and obey a lie. Don't do that. Whose responsibility is it not to do that? Me. Whose responsibility is Jesus speaks? The disciples who ask the questions and to whom he is answering. Notice, and ye, who's the ye? The disciples shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye, the disciples, what disciples? 
who are asking these questions. And who's he's answering? See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass. Now here's where it throws people a loop because it says the end is not yet. And automatically we forget context. We forget who, what, where and is being spoken about. And we think of the end of time of which Peter spoke when the elements melt with fervent heat and the, all of the wor world is burned up. All the material system has gone. But this has to do with something that would happen in their lifetime. Whose lifetime? People in the first century. I remind you the church is not established yet. The Lord has not suffered and died and been raised and gone back to heaven. But what he's talking about will come to pass after the church has been established. And a lot of things will be understood then they do not understand now. He's trying to prepare them for the fact that Judaism is going to cease its fulfilled its purpose. And it will cease when the temple is gone. Now, verse 4 or 7. For nation shall rile against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. I would suggest here to get the picture of this in the first century that you do some reading of the events over the next 30 years. And you'll find there was a tremendous turmoil in all these areas, more so than usual. And that's the point that our Lord is making here. It would take place in the lifetime of the very ones who asked the question. And what's the first question? When shall all these things be? What things? When not one stone will be left upon another of the temple. But he says, when you see these things, when you experience it, what, you, us, 2,000 years later? No, the people asked the question. He says, all oh, these are the beginning of sorrows. That's just the starting of it. But there'll be something you can, you will perceive these things. Now, then, when all these things are happening, shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And, shall be, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. They shall deliver you. Who? Us? Is that whose question he's answering? And he says, they shall uh, hate you. What you? People who's answered the question. Well, why are they going to do this? Because by the time these things happen, 30 years later, they'll be Christians. And the church will have been in existence for almost 30 years. And what's going to happen when all this begins? And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. This gives us an insight into why Peter, I think, in First and Second Peter, or you see how the writer of Hebrews addresses the problem among Jewish Christians in leaving the faith. This tells us what was happening. Great pressure and persecutions were being brought to bear from the outside on the church, but then on the inside, what's happening? Many false prophets shall arise. All of that's going on. Who's going to witness that? Members of the church. And some of these will be there. This is an answer to those people of the first century who would be Christians, though at this time they're asking the question and the question's being answered. They're not Christians. So he's forewarning them. Notice that many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. That's exactly what Peter said. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. If you want to find out who's genuinely faithful, then you let this kind of thing start coming on the church simply because we're Christians and love the Lord, and now somebody's going to stamp us out. They're going to destroy us because that was what was beginning to happen, first with the Jews, and then it would be worse as time went on. But what about the faithful Christian? He that shall endure unto, and here's the second time this is said, the end, the same shall be saved. What end? We've seen this already back over in verse 6, but the end is not yet. Every time the end is mentioned, it doesn't automatically mean the end of the world as we use that term. But he's talking about an end that would take place during their Lifetime. 
Now watch verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then, here it is again, and then shall the end come. What end? The end of the Jewish economy is completely removed. What's going to take place before that happens? The gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached in all the world. Now, did that happen? Read the first few verses of Colossians and see what the inspired Paul said. Paul said by the time he wrote to the church of Colossae, it's been preached to all the world. Jesus said that would happen. There's another sign. Do you think Paul's the only one that knew that the gospel had been made available to the people, that all the people had an opportunity to obey it? didn't mean they would, but it meant the opportunity had been granted them through the preaching of the gospel. And by the way, as a side thought, that tells you how seriously the early Christians took the heart of go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, 15. Not only that, but you hear people say we're Jehovah's Witnesses today. Well, a witness is one who can, through his five senses, experience things. Who does Jesus, or what does Jesus say, is the witness? The gospel. The gospel is the witness. Why? Because the gospel, God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1, 16, offers the evidence, the adequate evidence to convince any honest-hearted person, Luke 8, 15, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Now, this all is going to happen in the first century. And he says that's going to be one of the signs that you will see because you're going to be a part of that that you need to take note of along with all these others that herald forth the time when not one stone will be left upon another at the temple when all that's destroyed. So in the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. Well, all I have to do is say what happened in AD 70. All through the time from the beginning that the church was established in Acts chapter 2 on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, the church went preaching. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. And we close the book of Acts, Paul having completed three missionary tours and ending up in Rome. It was not long after that that unbelieving Jews rebelled and Rome did not tolerate rebellion. And so there was a great war down there for the last part of the AD 60s and then when Vespasian was chosen to be emperor after the year of the three emperors had all come up and down, three of them together, he went back for he was the leader at that time and he was made and proclaimed Caesar and his son Titus took over and destroyed that and the Arch of Titus stands in Rome this day, heralding what he accomplished when he overthrew the Jews, destroyed Jerusalem, crucified them by the hundreds of thousands, though so many more of them in the slavery. And all of that really is one reason that the secular writer Josephus was provoked to write what he did to try to say Jews aren't all that bad of people because they did not have a good reputation after Palestine and that area was destroyed. But now notice what he says in verse 15. When ye, therefore, therefore in the light of what I've just told you, in the light of the facts I've just said, when ye, therefore, ye who? You and me are the people who ask the question. A question based upon when the temple was, would be destroyed and not one stone left upon another. When ye, therefore, shall see. Now he's going to bring some Old Testament material in here. The abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Well, that's Daniel chapter 9 in verse 27 and earlier in verse 23, where Daniel predicted all of this. It's interesting that Daniel would do so because that's where we have such definitive material concerning Daniel 2, the specific 
time in which the Lord would establish His kingdom. Daniel 2.44. And that would be during the time of the Romans. So he says, you read, you understand. But this was said to the people of the first century. What people? The disciples of Christ. What disciples? Those that heard him say what he did and he left the temple. And saying to them, your house is left and you desolate. And they're showing him the temple. He says, you see not all these things? There's not be one stone left upon another. It's not be thrown down. And that weighs heavy on their mind and they pose those questions. He's still answering the first question. Folks, this is said to the people and applied to them of that day. Then, when all these things happen, let them which are in Judea flee into the mountains. Let me ask you something. If this pertains to the second coming of our Lord, I want to know how many of us are in Judea. And it would take a little while for us to get over there and flee into the mountains once we got there. And if the Lord's coming back, even for those that are in Judea, a lot of good he's going to do to flee into the mountains. Now next, let him which is on the house stop not come down to take anything out of his house. Those houses were built so that people could go up and set cool upon the house tops. Where was Peter when the Lord showed him by vision that uncircumcised Gentiles had a right to the gospel? The house of Simon the Tanner, where? He was on the house stop waiting for supper to be cooked. They spent their time there. So if you're up there resting and you see all these things happening, then what do you do? Well, this wouldn't do any good when the Lord comes back. Literally, at the end of the world as we use it. Neither let him which is in the field return back to the, take his clothes. Well, they generally worked out in the field, came back into the city and lived. Now, if you're in either one of these situations, what do you do? Well, we would say you better head for the hills as fast as you can. You don't go back and try to pack a bag. Then notice verse 19. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. Woe to nursing uh, pregnant women and nursing mothers. They didn't have Gerber baby food. They usually nursed their babies they're two or three years old. That put a very awful hardship on somebody that was a refugee fleeing somebody like the Roman armies and to get out of Jerusalem. Well, again, how would this have any bearing at all on the Lord's second coming when the world's destroyed? It's not going to make any difference whether you're pregnant or not, whether you've got a nursing child or not, or whether you're old or feeble or man or whatever. But notice what the obligation is for you to do, and they'll understand this better because by the time this happens and before it happens, they will have been Christians. Notice, but pray ye, ye who? The disciples who are being answered right here in this private conversation. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. None of that have a thing to do with the second coming of Christ. And why the Sabbath day? Because they shut the doors to Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. So you play that, that your time to leave and run is not going to be something that's going to be handicapping you. Winter time would be hard. Be terribly hard when you think of how people had to live to leave at that time. Now, what's going to be going on at that time? Verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not seen, or such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. The siege of Jerusalem starts. Now, you want to picture what went on? Read Josephus. He'll tell you. The starvation that took place, the terrible ordeal. Do you realize that up until the modern state of Israel took over and started doing what they did in reforestation and so forth, that the last of the great oak trees and such as that that was there in that part of the world around Jerusalem were cut down during the siege of Jerusalem. And they, it laid waste, basically, for all those years until the reforestation took place in the last 70 or so years. Now, he says further, and they can only mean something to those people at that time. And except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. What, what is it that will not be saved? A soul resurrected to be in heaven? Jesus said flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. What's going to be saved? No flesh shall be saved. Josephus gives an insight 
into one point, and nobody has an explanation for him. And he wasn't a believer. He knew about Christians, but he wasn't a Christian. And he says, when the gates one time were opened in Jerusalem, nobody knows why, and I'm paraphrasing, that the Christians fled out of those gates and were gone. I don't have to wonder why. Not for the faithful and all that faithfulness means, because they understood what was said here. They knew what to do. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake. Who's the elect? You ever read Book of Ephesians? While the elect make up the church. How are they the elect? They humble themselves in hearing the gospel, God's power to save, then they obeyed it. They would be the ones to be faithful in understanding these warnings and seeing these signs. They would realize what was going on. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ or there, believe it not. Now the unbelieving Jews say this won't happen to us. God's not going to let Jerusalem be destroyed. He won't let this temple be destroyed. They had that attitude before Babylon came and took them. Oh no, this is where the temple is. Oh no. But they failed to realize God doesn't just bless you because you're a fleshly Jew. You must be faithful. And now they fulfill their purpose. It's over and done with. And they're gone. There's no more reason for fleshly Israel to exist. But for the elect's sake, they're going to be everything working. Now, here's a point to make. Remember my sermon from last Sunday afternoon. God's providential care of his people. God's able to work this. But in this case, it involved the Christians being faithful and recognizing those signs that Jesus gives right here. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. It will appear to be so. Insomuch that if it were possible, what would they do? They would deceive the very, the truly elect. And that's what Peter says. Many false prophets have gone out into the world, even as it was back there in the Old Testament days. What is your obligation? Well, Jude tells us, I was going to write to you about the salvation that's common to us all, but I was compelled to do what? To contend for the faith, once for all delivered to the saints. Now notice the clincher here. Speaking to these disciples privately, answering their questions concerning First one, tell us when shall these things be? He says, Behold, I've told you before. Who's the you? The ones who asked the question, when was that? In the first century, about AD 30, according to the calendar you use. And I've told you before. In other words, you've asked me. I've told you. Now, verse 26, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. Now, here it gets a little troublesome because he reverts to apocalyptic language. And this happens among the Jews and among the Christians when they're wanting to say God is intervening to change the worldly order of things. Well, he certainly is. Israel he had protected for 1,500 years. Now he's going to remove them. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, it shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Me, and everybody forgets everything there is about context and who, what, when, and all that. And they think that has to be the end of time as we see it. This is a populistic language. It's simply saying a great movement. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. The standard of the Romans was eagles. The dead carcass is Israel. It fulfills no more purpose. And thus they're there to feed upon the dead carcass. That's just the oriental mind speaking the way they did in those days. And as the book of Revelation and Daniel and some in Ezekiel use that kind of terminology. You have to study their symbolism to see what's happening. It was a way of simply saying, here is a sign. It's a neon sign. It's in red. It's flashing. And what does that do? It gets your attention. And that's, the way, that's their neon sign. That's saying that's what's going to happen. 
Immediately after the tribulation of those days, what days? The days of destruction of Jerusalem. Shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And everybody went out and looked through smoke glass to see all that going on. And that didn't literally happen. You got the same thing said before the church started. Moon turning into blood and all that kind of thing. What does it mean? God's stepping in. God's performing what he said he would do. He did that in starting the spiritual kingdom, the church. Now he's doing it simply saying, this is the way it's going to happen. Moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. How are the powers of the heaven shaken? Paul says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers in heavenly places. When we speak the truth and live in our lives and contend for the faith, we're fighting against the devil, the prince of this world, and against his henchmen. We're not just fighting men. We're fighting against that which opposes God. The war that we fight, we are soldiers of the Lord. We put on the whole armor of God. The battle we fight is far greater than what we're doing right here. This is proof of God's legions fighting against the devil's hordes. And so he's talking about that. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes on earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And everybody knows that must be the end of this present age. It's not. It's talking about the power of the gospel of Christ. No wonder Paul said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Now read him when he appears uh, uh, before and makes his defense, which is actually preaching a sermon, before Felix, Festus, and Agrippa, in which it must have been virtually the same thing when he appeared before Nero. And see what he declares as to the power of God. And he shall send his angels. Uh-oh, now we've got the spirit being. No, an angel. Remember us studying about angels? Angelos simply means a messenger. And they'll go forth with the great sound of a trumpet. They're evangelists, brethren. You angelistes, they herald forth the gospel. The great impediment with, uh, of the gospel and first persecutors of the church is unbelieving Israel. And they're removed. They've been destroyed. They don't have the same power they once had. And they shall gather together his elect. Who's going to gather together the elect? Those preaching the gospel. How do they do it? People hearing them believe. And when they obey it, they're gathered together from the four winds all over the world. From one end of heaven to the other. This is apocalyptic language. It's the purpose of apocalyptic language. I can't interpret it like I can literal language. And he's still talking privately to the disciples, answering that first question. And you're going to see in plain language in a moment. I know that. <laughs> now learn a parable of the fig tree. When the branch is tender and put forth the leaves, notice, you disciples, you who ask this question, ye know that summer's near. You see how it applies to them the first century. You know. You know how to read those signs. You know summer's near. So likewise, ye, ye who, <laughs> you can say ye who, ye who, ye disciples. When ye, who, you disciples, shall see all these things, know that it's near even at the doors. Now watch, verse 34 is the clincher. It's the transition verse from the first question he's been asking, which is very detailed on the signs that would precede the destruction of Jerusalem. But now watch. Verily I say unto you, truly it's a fact, I'm saying to you, the disciples who asked this question and giving the answer, this generation shall not pass. You can't get plainer what I'm about to say, that our Lord said, till all these things be fulfilled. Whatever is said before verse 34 was going to be fulfilled or feel full in the first century. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. How sure can you be that these things will be fulfilled in your lifetime? 
that you need to be able to accomplish your faithfulness. How sure will heaven and earth pass away? But my words won't. Then notice the transition to the second question. And notice that that question, they don't realize they ask it, no doubt. They think it's all lumped together and what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world. But notice, but of that day and hour knoweth no man. He just finished a whole list of stuff that those disciples would see in their lifetime. That they could know they were told not to be deceived. They were told it was going to all take place in their lifetime. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now he's answering the second question. It's a compound question. And what is it? And what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? There's where he begins to answer that question. And what does he say? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. I don't know why we can't see him saying that what he says before verse 34 is going to be fulfilled in the first century while some of the disciples who asked that question and have now been given the answer will apply it and will need it. And then he turns around and says, but of that day and hour knoweth no man concerning the second coming of Christ. Not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. How is it going to be when the Lord comes back? But as in the days of knowing, were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, he just got through talking about earlier the certain coming of the Son of Man. Obviously, that phrase, coming of the Son of Man, doesn't always mean the same thing. I must understand the first time he used it in the context which he's given, and he's answering their question about when shall, all, when shall all these things be? That is, the destruction of the temple. So there's different comings. God came in judgment, if you please, upon Jerusalem and Judea with the Babylonians. Came in judgment up directly through angels with Sodom and Gomorrah. He came in judgment upon the Canaanites through the children of Israel. And came in judgment of the whole world in Noah's day, which he uses here as an example, with the great flood. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. They're going to be doing just what we're doing today. Never think anything to worry about anything. They're just going about their daily business. And knew not until the flood came. That tells you how sudden that flood came. And took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This coming is considered to be different from the one he mentions that pertained to the disciples in Jerusalem in the first century in verse 34. Then shall two be in the field. One shall be taken, the other left. There's going to be people prepared and unprepared. That's the idea. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. One shall be taken, the other left. He uses their circumstances. Not anybody that I know any women out grinding at the mill nowadays the way they ground grain at the mill then. So he gives it to them on their level of understanding at that time how it would be because nobody knew when he was coming. He might come. I hear people saying, well, the early church thought Christ was coming in the first century. There's no indication of that. They believe this. They didn't. They didn't know. They didn't know when he would be coming. And then watch verse 42. Watch, therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. All these other th verses must be understood within the context of that and answering the second question. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken into. Therefore be ye, who? The disciples who asked this question, also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Third time he used the Son of Man cometh. In a complete different context, from answering the first question. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Watch verse 46. Blessed is the servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all goods, all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and so on and so forth. The point being, if you're going to be unfaithful, and if you're not going to be prepared, what happens to you? Verse 51, when he comes, he'll cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Now, it's after that we come to what we have is 25, and we have the great parables on the kingdom. And when you come through there, you will see in verse 13, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country. Then look down at verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. Now He tells you what's going to happen as He tells those disciples in the first century in around A.D. 30 in answering that second compound question. He talks about what's going to take place when He does come back. The judgment of the whole world when this whole system of things is ended. But brethren, I hope these will help us realize there are no end time signs that say, now the Lord's coming next week or next year or five years from now. None of that. But the early church was given the wherewithal to escape out of Judea and Jerusalem by the signs Jesus left it. And by the time that all took place, many of them will have been members of the church for many, many years. Don't you think they studied this? We study it. We're studying it right now. Don't you think they did? Don't you think they understood this? We've got the words of Jesus preserved by the inspired Matthew said to the disciples in answering their questions. Why wouldn't they have studied it? That's why Matthew wrote it, was to convince the Jews that Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of God, did these things happen like Jesus said they did? Imagine a Jew in A.D. 80 reading this. He knows it happened just like that. He knows it better than anybody today does because he would have lived through a lot of it. Don't be led astray by the error of the wicked. That was said then, and it can be said today correctly and rightly, and it's as needful today as ever, and it will be to the end of time. But to begin, you must become a Christian, believing that Christ is the Son of God, repenting of your sins, Confessing your faith in Him as the Son of God and being baptized by His authority for the remission of your past sins. The Lord will add you to His church when you do that and you can serve Him faithfully. As a child of God, are you walking faithfully? If not, then you need to repent of whatever it is that's handicapping you. Come confessing them and praying God for forgiveness while we stand and while we sing.